Hello. Welcome everyone. Just have a couple of folks still coming in um, and we'll get started in a second here. So hello everybody. Welcome to our Fresno session one of Calame Links. Um, this session is on so you want to be a community supports provider. And uh, you know, Calame Links is a technical assistance and resource provider for um, community supports providers. And my name is Sadhana Devaraja. I'm going to be one of your facilitators for the session today. And um, I'm managing director at Health Begins and just so excited to be with all of you all um, on this journey. Um, at Health Begins, just a little bit about us, we're a national mission-driven consulting and training firm. And we're really trying to help healthcare and community partners improve the structural and social drivers of health equity for patients and communities. Um, and we're just really glad that you're all able to join us today. Um, if we go to the next slide, just a reminder, I know you just saw this, but we are recording. So smile, we have recording in progress. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, we'd love to get to know folks better. So if you could just take a second here to update your name on Zoom with your preferred pronouns and the name of your organization, that would be really helpful as we you know, chat with each other on chat, um, as I may call, you, uh, call on you during the session and it would just be um, best if we can kind of know who we're speaking with in this room. Um, if you could in the chat, just share three words that describe how you're feeling today. Um, we would just love to get kind of a sense of where folks are at um, entering this room. I know that it can feel different ways for different folks given the day. Um, I know it's very hot where I am today um, and maybe the case for you as well. Um, and we're really looking forward to an interactive session. So, you know, feel free to chat um, as, as much as you'd like with each other. We've had um, times on other sessions where, you know, participants are chatting with each other over shared interests, and we really encourage that as well as chatting with us. Um, and thank you, Alexis, for kicking us off with some words about how you're feeling today. Um, and so maybe what I'll do now is kind of go around the room. Um, and see how folks are are feeling. Um, and if you could unmute, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on the CBO. So there are a number of uh, project team members here from the Health Begins side. Um, and I will instead go to the CBOs um, to see how you all are doing. So Jenny, could I ask you to unmute and Jenny Gonzalez, um, and just let us know who you are um, and your organization, if you don't mind. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out real quick. Um, no problem. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my, hi, Jenny. Hi, my name's uh, Jenny Gonzalez. I'm the uh, deputy administrator over at West Carrot, California. Um, let's see, how am I feeling today? Um, it's been a busy morning already, so just a little overwhelmed. <laughs> I feel that. Um, and see. I feel like overwhelmed is a uh, good enough word to take up three. <laughs> yeah, so I'm fairly new to familiarizing myself with all of this. Um, so I'm just here to like really listen in and have a better understanding. Um, but uh, that would be me. I love that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Is there are any of the folks on the call your peers um, that you could call on that yeah. you know of? Sorry, uh, and I think you are muted. I, I do believe our vice president is on the call, as well as our uh, director of contract compliance. Oh, there she is, Marianne and uh, Michelle. Yeah, good morning. So I'm Marianne Noy, vice president of West Care. And yes, uh, we are, for myself, we worked in Medi-Cal for West Care for a lot of treatment services um, and did some pilot projects to do some in lieu services in the past. So we are definitely interested in um, being able to provide some community supports in, you know, the Central Valley. We're also working in Stanislaw County to get contracted to do some ECM um, and some community support. So yeah, we're like dipping our toes fully in the water, but also trying to get a better understanding for ourselves too, to make sure that, um, that we're on the right track. I love that. Thank you so much, Marianne. And um, we've heard that's kind of the best way to do it, kind of put both feet in and learn as you go on this. So I think uh, you're on the right track there. And Michelle, it looks like you're with 
Um, yeah, hi everybody. My name is Michelle Allen and I'm the Director of Contract Compliance. And as the two ladies before me said, I'm part of the Three Musketeers that's trying to navigate um, through these new opportunities that have been presented um, to our agency. So we're, we're glad to be here and, and to work with you all. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and I see, um, is it Cletus Shelton who has come on camera too? And so I'm going to call on you next, if you don't mind. Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. Cletus Shelton, Vice President of California Operations, um, partners in crime with all those three lovely ladies. Um, so yeah, I've been with Wesker for 13 years and we, um, you know, recently with Cal Ames and, and all of our Medi-Cal programs and Department of Health Care. So we're just trying to uh, navigate the, the new pieces for the community support and et cetera. So thank you for putting this together and um, us getting the invite to be able to participate. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining and um, really looking forward for to your engagement during this this session today to make sure we're you know meeting what you all are hoping to, to get out of this. Um, maybe I'll go over to Felicia Batts. Um, for a quick hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Felicia Batts, and I'm from um, Fresno American Indian Health Project. We're an urban Indian organization here in Fresno, and we have medical and behavioral health. I oversee um, quality and strategic projects, and just here, happy to learn. Um, so thank you for hosting this today. Thank you so much, Felicia. So glad to have you here. Um, Victoria, oh, oh, and actually, let me ask you, Felicia, are there any of your peers or colleagues on the call as well, so that we can kind of link? Yeah, I, I believe I see Amber. Amber, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, Felicia. Okay. there you are. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Amber Molina. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Services um, at Fresno American Indian Health Project. Nice to meet you, Amber. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. And so I will go over to Victoria Cole. See if Victoria is able to say hello. Hi, I'm Victoria. I am the Grant Administrator for Pavarello House here in Fresno. Um, I just started this position, so I'm really excited to learn about the new opportunities available to us. That's great. And could you tell me a little bit more about what uh, you all do? Yeah, so Pover Low House um, is started as a homeless shelter. We currently have two shelters on our campus. Uh, we provide food services, clothing, um, basic needs, case management, navigation to anyone who needs it. Um, we also have a um, resident men's residential rehab program, and we just started about a year ago a mental health um, program. That's great. Thank you so much, Victoria. Do you have any other um, kind of folks from your team on this? No, side? I'm the only one. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Uh -huh. um, Deanne Blankenship. If I could ask Good you. morning. Um, this is Deanne. I'm a senior director at the California Health Collaborative. Um, we just started our um, ECM work in the Sacramento Valley today. So that's why the excitement and the tired um, and all of that, and our um, our contracts with Anthem, we're supposed to start ECM in Fresno and a couple other counties around there, uh, January 1st. So, um, and then we're also talking about community support. So that's why I'm here today. And thank you so much for hosting this. Thank you so much for joining. And that's great. So you have some kind of experience on the contracting side through ECM and um, looking to expand. So it'll be great to hear from you in terms of um, perspectives on that process, which I know is different, but also might have some similar um, kind of learning curve. So thanks for joining. Um, do, are any of your um, peers or colleagues on this call? Uh, yeah. I don't think so. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Giovanna, Giovanna D from West. Hello everyone, hi. Um, my name is Giovanna from West Fresno Family Resource Center. Um, sorry, the uh, I don't think the webcam works really well, so that's why you know I don't have it on. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe next time it'll work. Um, but yeah, so I'm uh, representing the uh, finance and HR department for our organization, and um, our executive director um, is actually I believe she was on the call. I saw her, uh, Yolanda Randall's. Um, and um, yeah, just pleasure to be amongst you all. Thanks for joining us, Giovanna. And Yolanda, could I ask you to do a little intro yourself? 
I'm sure. Hi, good morning, everybody. Yolanda Randos, Director of West Fresno Family Resource Center. We are a community-based organization housed in Southwest Fresno, providing social services support. So anywhere from uh, Medi-Cal enrollment, mental health support, uh, youth empowerment, as well as uh, support for our seniors. So Giovanna, yes, she is. I'm so excited that she's on the call. She's from our finance department and also Maria Aguirre, uh, who is our one of our case managers that will be supporting this initiative. And so we are excited to be here. So we are the, the newbies on the block in terms of community support and Medi-Cal billing and just uh, we are a sponge. And so we are here to learn as much as we can so that we can get this program going you know, within our agency. So thank you so much for putting this on. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us, Yolanda. And, you know, something that I've learned, especially through these sessions is, you know, the newbies have experience to share just as well as the folks that have more contracting experience. So really looking forward to the insights that you can share with us, as well as, um, you know, the questions that might come up for you. So thank you for your active engagement here. Um, and I'm going to ask Maria, um, it sounds like you're part of the same team, if you could unmute introduce yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Maria Aguirre, and yes, I am with the West Fresno Family Research Center. And um, yes, we are new to this, um, you know, initiative, CalAIM. Um, so I'm really looking forward, you know, to learn. Um, very open to, to learn, and um, I ask a lot of questions. So. Perfect. <laughs> That's my favorite type of person, Maria. So <laughs> thank you so much thank um, you. for joining and um, looking forward to, to all of the questions because it just makes us all better. Um, so appreciate that in advance. Thank um, you. I will um, turn to maybe Carol Blomgren and see if you're able to unmute and just uh, introduce yourself. And I see Carol unmuted, but I can't hear her. I don't know if you might be double muted, Carol. And if by chance the mic is not working, you know, just feel free to um, chat in as you see fit. So I'm actually going to keep this going. Sorry, Carol, I, we can't hear you. I see you unmuted. Um, but maybe you can chat in and we can get, um, you know, who you are and your organization, um, whatever you'd like to share with us. So thank you all for that. That was really lovely. I, I loved getting to know a little bit more about each of you and hoping through this um, first session, as well as, you know, the two sessions to follow that we'll get to do a little bit more of that. Um, and also, you know, as always, thank you all for the extraordinary work that you're doing in your communities. It's, it's, um, so inspiring um, to be on these calls with, with all of you um, to learn a bit about the way you're contributing and um, being a small piece of that. So today, you know, what we're hoping to do, I'll go over some objectives in a second. We'll, um, and what we're planning to do is to talk a little bit about what the CalAIM Links program is um, so that you're familiar with what this project is as well as the resources that are available through this project. Um, we'll talk about pathways to becoming a provider, including some um, pieces of certification, certification applications um, that would be helpful um, or are necessary in order to, you know, contract with the plans in your area. Um, and then we'll talk about some contracting requirements that are attendant with becoming a community supports provider and performing um, and providing those services. There are, you know, two designated sections for Q&A, but really we um, love questions, as I mentioned before. So Maria, especially, you know, don't wait till the those Q&A points, you know, ask your questions throughout. Um, we want this to be conversational. Um, it's always helpful for us when folks are able to ask their questions while we're going along so that we can tailor the content as we go rather than, you know, wait um, till to any one moment. Um, so just really encourage you all to do that. And part of why I wanted to have you unmute at the top is so that we can get used to unmuting during this meeting. Um, and you all did A plus on that. So thank you for that. If we go to the next slide, um, and thank you, Victoria, for your um, intro here. Um, if we go to the, the slide, the objectives for today 
are that we're hoping by the end of this session, we'll all be able to understand some of the goals and resources that are related to this Kellane Links project that we're um, embarking on together in Fresno County today. Um, to understand what it means to get certified through your plan. So we'll walk through those applications. We have our plan partners here um, to help make that happen. Um, and then understand some of the contracting requirements at a high level. Um, something we'll be asking, you know, throughout this session and certainly at the end is, you know, where do you need more information? You know, where are there gaps? Um, I know that through these sessions, sometimes there's the gap is, you know, I kind of want to know everything, um, especially for fo folks early in the journey. Um, but as much information as you can give us about what is helpful, what you're looking more for more of, um, that'll help us kind of cultivate and curate the right curriculum for, for the future sessions. Um, so with that, I'll just talk, you know, I'm going to go pretty quickly about the program and the next slide, you'll see, um, you know, it's the program overview, meaning Kelly and Link's art project. Um, there are a few slides on this, and this is just background to like, you know, why we're here. Um, but so you know, we are part of a team with Aurora Health Group and Transform Health. Um, the three of us work together on building out the content that you'll see here today and some of the content that I'll talk about, I'll refer to. And we are funded by the California Healthcare Foundation. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is just a, a sincere thank you to our program officer, Carlina Hansen, um, who's been uh, helping guide and um, overseeing this project. If you go to the next slide, um, just some of the background is that, you know, we have been hearing about CalAIM for a few years, and we knew that to realize the promise of this, of CalAIM, we needed to figure out new ways to be able to help support CBOs um, in the CBO Managed Care Plan Partnership. This was really driven by some focus groups that we had done, um, or rather we had convened some community based workforce members throughout the state of California in 2020. That's when we started hearing this and that's when we started developing the program for this. Um, and so kind of just to reiterate that feedback from the community, from the community-based organizations is really what's driving this work and what will continue to drive, um, you know, what we're able to present to you on. If you go to the next slide, some of the successes that we saw from our first entree into this, um, late last year um, was that we were able to start work in four counties and work with three plan partners um, and really were able to kind of get some movement on that TA provision before Calling kicked off on January 1st. And then um, we're able to continue it through, you know, this series of TA sessions now. If you go to the next slide. Um, these are some of the program goals and what's really important is, you know, on those headlines. The purpose of this effort is to advance equity. What we're hoping to do is by providing these TA sessions, by connecting more with the community-based organizations and the counties that we're serving, that we're able to support um, really CBOs that are led by and serve people from communities that are historically marginalized um, and by societal practices and policies. And so that's what we're um, hoping to bring uh, together, who we're hoping to bring together in these sessions. And we're also hoping that through this effort, we're able to build these relationships. So, you know, the way you all unmuted and shared about yourselves um, is really helpful in building those relationships with each other, um, as well as with the plans so that we can um, kind of create an environment to, to move forward um, using kind of CalAIM and community supports as one of the vehicles to do that because we know that it's not just going to be CalAIM. There are always these kind of opportunities um, where we can build some infrastructure among us um, to move that um, kind of goal of advancing equity together. And just that, you know, health begins and our project team partners are here to help. And so we're, we're really listening to you to see how we can um, best provide that support to achieve those aims. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, there's a lot of text here, but just really, this is more for background for you all afterwards, if you wanted to learn more about the county sessions, where we are, um, that and the plans that we're working with. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is really the slide that I think is most important of, of all of that kind of intro, which is, this is where our resources 
are stored through this project. So if you go to healthbegins.org backslash CalAIM, and I think that'll be um, put in the chat as well, um, you can get, oh, there it is. Thank you, Alexis. Um, you can get this, the recording for this session, the recording from other sessions, um, decks, upcoming events, um, all that information on that website. So um, hopefully that'll be a great resource for you as you're um, kind of continuing this work, as you're bringing other colleagues in, as you um, kind of refresh on some of the content because it might not have felt pertinent at the time you read it, but then as you get to a different stage in your relationship, it becomes more pertinent. Um, so hopeful that this will be a great place for you to revisit um, as you go through your journey as well. So um, I intentionally raced through that and I am not a fast talker, so I'm always like a little uncomfortable racing through things, but it was really so that I could spend more time on, you know, today's session and where we're going moving forward. So I'm going to take a breath and kind of situate us for today's session. This is um, session one, you know, so you want to be a um, community support provider, pathways to becoming a community support provider. We will be having additional sessions in November and then in December um, to really keep folks along that contracting line. These are the sessions that we're planning. Um, and again, to kind of reiterate that based on your feedback, these could change. If we're hearing from the, from the community, from you all in the room that uh, you know, we're actually pretty far along on contracting and we don't need to prepare to contract next time, we can shift that focus and we kind of have a menu of topics with, with like which we can draw from to be able to really tailor um, what this experience will be like for Fresno County CBOs. Um, so this is what we're planning right now and really look forward to hearing back from you all in terms of what would be the right fit for your community. There are some assumptions that we have about viewers um, coming into this. And I think, you know, hearing from you all, there's, um, you're already matching a lot of this. So location, we want to focus in on Fresno County. I know a few of you had mentioned serving in multiple counties, which is great um, because you can draw from those experiences. Um, but our common kind of centering ground here is that you are serving Fresno, um, that you have interest, right? You're you're interested in pursuing a contract with a managed care plan. Um, I know that folks may be in different levels of interest. It might be, well, I'm interested depending on what I need to do um, and whether it's worth it um, in terms of time and burden and administrative responsibility. And that's part of what we can help um, suss out through our conversations here. Um, and some of you may already have been in contract. Um, so that what that interest means can vary. And we'll kind of try to um, ask questions along the way to better gauge where that interest and kind of action lies for you. Um, level of understanding. So this is kind of an important one. We do assume that folks know what Cal AIM is. So when we talk about Cal AIM and when we talk about community supports, that there is, um, you know, pretty much an understanding of what those terms mean. And if there isn't, there are supplemental materials on our website. Um, I think they were also shared with you. You can review those materials to get caught up and also for your colleagues to get caught up if they need to. But we won't be doing some of those primers um, in any detail here because we're going to go right into, you know, what are those certification applications? Um, what are the contracting requirements? Um, so if you ever do feel like, oh, I do need some of that um, kind of primer information to get to the next stage, um, please refer to our website um, and some of the content that's provided in, in other venues through that training supplement, through some statewide sessions that we offer, um, that kind of thing. Um, and this prerequisite, we are hoping that everyone is able to submit a CBO readiness assessment, just so we can understand where you are in the process um, and to be able to tailor the curriculum. And so thank you, Alexis, if you have not taken it yet, um, there is that link in the chat that Alexis just placed. It does take a few minutes to fill out. And so, you know, if we end early, that might be a good time to take it, um, but would really appreciate that um, feedback if you're able to, to provide it. If we go to the next slide, these are some of the things that we did hear back um, from folks coming into this meeting. So based on CBO feedback, we heard um, interest in learning about financial intermediaries, 
um, th through performance and reporting requirements, um, talking about models of care, payment and pricing mechanisms, and data sharing. So it kind of ranges from like structural um, considerations of models of care and financial in intermediaries, as well as you know the details of reporting and data sharing and technical aspects of um, of payment. So it, there is a range in terms of types of TA that's being requested. Um, and what we've heard from the plans based on, you know, what they're receiving is, and what they're hearing from community is that contracting requirements um, would be helpful to cover as well as certification applications. So we are planning um, with this information to tailor the content over the these three sessions to cover these items um, and we'll adjust as we go. Um, and this is going to be the first of just a few polls that we'll have today, um, kind of alluded to this earlier to make sure that we can um, know who's in the room and be able to um, see, you know, where we need to fit our, our content. So for today, um, we are interested to hear where you are, where you are in the contracting process with your health plan. Um, and like I mentioned, it could be, you know, you're just beginning to think about it. Um, and that's part of why you're here. Uh, some of you have thought about it and you're getting your things, your materials together. Um, you may have had some conversations with the plan. Um, some of you may have submitted the certification tool already. Um, and so, you know, reviewing that today might not be as important. Um, some of you are in the contracting process. You might be reviewing a contract, might receive something, and then some of you may have a signed contract. Um, I know that this month might be challenging for some folks to, to know because um, you might have a signed contract in some ways and not in others. We are talking about community supports um, for this. So if we could, I think we're sharing the results already. Is that right? Um, you'll see yeah. that we've got, thank you. We've got um, a little less than half of folks who responded. Um, saying that you're at the earliest stages, right? We're almost, you know, over half are at the earliest stages of beginning to think about it and preparing materials, um, having initial conversations. And a few of you have a signed contract. So um, would love to have kind of that conversation among the folks that are, you know, starting to think about it and those that have a signed contract. I'm, um, I'm curious to hear, you know, who were the ones that said they had a signed contract? I know Deanne, you might be one of those, um, but just wanted to pause to see. Um, who might have responded that they had a signed contract? So West Fresno Family Resource Center. Okay. So we do have a signed uh, contract. Oh, great. Uh, with the uh, Calviva for community support. That's wonderful. And what what's the community support that you're um, contracted housing, for? Housing, uh, housing navigation. Apologies. Okay, that's wonderful, Yolanda. So we may um. And, you know, look to you and Giovanna and Maria to offer some insights from that that process. So thank you for for sharing that. Um, if we go to the next slide, we had um, actually we can do that second poll. Yeah, we had you know talked about advancing equity and um, what that uh, the meaning that it has for this project. So if folks could just take a second to um, indicate which of these populations below um, you serve at least um, or represent at least 20 percent of your organization. So we're looking for um, within this list which of these populations represent at least 20 percent of the individuals your organization served last year um, and you can check all that apply. And this would, you know, also be helpful for you know, future sessions as we think about um, tailoring content. So appreciate folks um, chiming in here. And I see folks are still kind of making some selections. Okay. And I'll need it just for one more second. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, and so if you look at, you know, this community here that we have in the room, it looks like, you know, 
most of you are serving Medi-Cal eligible children and adults, which makes a lot of sense for being in this conversation. So glad to see that. Um, and then many of you are serving individuals experiencing homelessness, um, adults with serious mental illness, um, and people with limited English proficiency. proficiency. Um, there's, a, there's a big mix here in terms of the populations that, that you all are serving. Um, appreciate this feedback. So um, with that, I'm going to talk just a little bit about pathways to becoming a provider. This is one of the things that um, I think folks had mentioned in their feedback, like kind of that financial intermediary point um, that we wanted to touch on before we go forward. And um, as we you know, start this section, I do want to give an opportunity for our plan contacts to introduce themselves. And so maybe I'll ask uh, Brandy if you are able to um, unmute and say hello, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Brandy Jenkins, Regional, Regional Program Manager here for Anthem, and I cover the Central Valley and the rural Northern California counties. Thank you so much, Brandy. So glad to have you here with us. Um, and then I think Crystal, I saw earlier, um, she might've had to drop off for a second. Um, is there someone from HealthNet in her stead? I might not be seeing. Okay. Um, so I think we will move ahead with Brandy and see if um, Crystal can rejoin. I saw her earlier um, while we uh, keep moving and we can have an intro then. So, you know, there's kind of two pathways um, that we see for moving forward for CBO's contracting. It's um, contracting directly with a managed care plan, um, which is, you know, kind of the, the premise that we're working under for today in terms of the, um, the things that we'll share. Um, I will say a lot of the requirements that we'll share are probably still going to be in play if you do option two, um, at least the ones that we're talking about today, um, which is there could be a contracting entity that is not your CBO um, that is directly contracting with the plan and you would then subcontract to the contracting agency. And so um, we've seen this model in, in different locations um, where they're serving as kind of an administrative hub, that contracting entity to manage the community service providers. And so wanted to kind of posit that model here as two different ways that CBOs can become community support providers. Um, if we go to the next slide, in that you know, option one of directly contracting with a managed care provider, um, it means that certain criteria have to be met. That means uh, ability to meet service delivery, capacity, data sharing infrastructure, ability to bill, meet reporting requirements. These are you know, some of the things that we'll talk about today. Um, and you'll be required to do that. Um, and if we go look at that option two, Oh, on the next slide, sorry. In that indirect contract with a contracting entity, um, in some counties, what that could look like is that the CBO, the community support providers, all of you would be subcontractors of the county or the contracting entity. Um, and like I mentioned, those CBOs would still have to meet all the service requirements, um, but the county or that like intermediary may take on certain administrative um, functions. And so based on what I heard in terms of introductions, I don't think there are any of those contracting entities um, on the call today. Um, but that is, you know, one of the models that we're hearing about. And so I know, Rishi, I was going to turn it over to you for the next section anyways, and I'm just wondering if there was anything you would want to add to this um, before as we go to the next section as well. No, if anything, I'd just like to love to just see how that resonates with before we move to certification applications, just with um, everybody in the line here, um, you know, based on what you've covered so far with the CBO contracting kind of options. Just curious, um, it's not a formal poll, but maybe in the chat or if anybody wants to unmute, just to uh, share a little bit about what, which kind of options you're considering or you've already pursued, whether to contract directly with a plan or to work with a contracting entity that's working with a plan in order to um, deliver community supports.
just to orient us to which model it seems to be most aligned with what you're thinking about. I might call on folks uh, maybe from Westcare um, just to share or Amber from American Fresno American Indian Health Project. Just curious what your thoughts are. Are you thinking about direct contracting? Yeah, so I'll be honest. Um, this is all new to me, and I, I was asked to be on this call, so I'm not really sure where we stand with this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a better, or my colleague Felicia would answer it better, but she had to hop off um, for a separate okay. meeting. I'm, I'm sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. Thanks, and uh, and sorry to put you guys on the, on the hot seat there. I think it's uh, maybe the takeaway, as Southern was kind of mentioning, is that uh, what we've been seeing is that there, there are these two fundamental pathways that a lot of CBOs have, and that might be particularly important for those who are just beginning to think about this opportunity to work with plans to support community supports. And so, yeah, and thanks, Deanne, as well, for answering that in the chat. And Michelle, thank you as well. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, Salvador, I think that's that's it. Just trying to get it. This is Cletus Shelton from Westcare. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, we, we currently have contracts with uh, Fresno County, uh, Kern County, Kings County, Contra Costa County um, for different type, you know, SUD, mental health services, and et cetera. Um, to, you know, we also have uh, housing service contracts um, within Fresno County and are a big role in the for Fresno Madera continuum of care. Um, so our goal is to not only continue building in um, those long-term uh, relationships we have with the counties, but also the number one option, direct, you know, directly contracting with plans mm -hmm. to, be able to provide the community support services and the EC mm -hmm. those additional um, avenues. So mm -hmm. that's where, you know, we're, we're kind of going through this. We've been operating a certain way for so many years with one path and now mm -hmm. there's this new path and opportunity. So we're just, you know, here trying to navigate that that swim uphill, I mean, upstream um, mm -hmm. <laughs> without feeling, feeling like we don't have paddles sometimes. <laughs> we definitely know what that feels like um, as well and sympathize, but I really appreciate that that comment. Um, and I, I think it's an interesting this kind of observation that might um, have more resonance or might resonate more as everybody goes through um, this journey and thinking about the paths available. And for example, some are, as you're saying, already thinking about now how to, how to expand into direct contracting or you already have a direct contract uh, with a plan. Some um, might be finding that, and we're seeing this in other counties as well, some organizations, because of the administrative bandwidth and um, experience with contracting, are are being approached to serve as the contracting entity on behalf of smaller or, um, CBOs and, and organizations as well. So I think it's an observation of just the different paths that are emerging. And it's particularly important because what we've seen time and again and across the state is, as, and as I'm sure you guys all can attest to better than we can, um, sometimes smaller CBOs face a real challenge about whether to proceed with a, a, this kind of work with Medi-Cal plans because they don't perceive that they have the administrative capacity to kind of enter into this type of direct contracting relationship. And so because we're coming at this from a very specific equity lens, it's, it's all the more reason for us to kind of share this observation to say that we're seeing different pathways emerge, even for smaller organizations that may want to um, get involved, but maybe a little bit shy about or a little bit nervous about taking on the contracting responsibilities. So. But thanks. Let's keep on going, and then maybe I'll I'll take the baton here since I've already grabbed it here, so I'll then move on to certification applications. So, I think we just have um, friends from Anthem right now on um, Brandy. Thanks. Good to see you again. And um, our goal here is just to turn this over to you and to our friends from HealthNet if they rejoin to walk through the certification process. Particularly helpful for those who are maybe earlier in the journey. So, uh, Brandy, I'll turn it to you. And as you know, there's a couple of slides here, so feel free to prompt us to advance the slides. Sure. Okay, great. Can you go to the letter of interest? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so for Anthem, and um, I'll just preface this by saying Anthem and Calvivo, we do use a lot of the same information, so there doesn't need to be double work for most of it. We do have two separate um, letter of interest forms. Pretty much, I think they probably are asking for the same information. Um, I know ours, it has ECM or enhanced care management and community supports information on there. But the main things that we are looking for, and you can see right here on the left, is the organizational information. Um, and then again, this is just like a screenshot. I think it's about three pages, our actual form. Um, and then 
it goes down to the point of contact information, which is very uh, important so that we know who to reach out to and deal with when we're dealing with or doing dealing with the ECM or CS application. And then which counties your organization serves? Um, are you wanting to do ECM or CS or both? And then your target populations that your organization um, or current providers will serve and then the current services uh, your organization provides. If you go to the next slide. And then this is also what we do share um, as far as like the application goes, we do share both ECM and CS applications. They are set up just a little bit differently. Um, at the top of ours, you'll have all the different populations of focus. And then there's gonna be a diff different, a couple of different required um, sections that everyone has to fill out. And I think ours are split. I think we have one at the top and then one at the bottom of the application. And then you go to your specific CS um, service that you do want to provide. And then that's the um, information that you do fill out specifically for that uh, community support service. Um, when it comes to our certification application and contracting process, it can probably take anywhere from around three to nine months, depending on how long it takes to get the application turned in. Um, we go through our gap analysis process, which is back and forth between us and the provider um, with information that needs to be either more information that needs to be given, whatever the gaps are that, from the application. So let me just back up. So it starts with our letter of interest. And then we will, re in return, send out the application. And then you provide us the application back with your documentation. From there, we do a gap analysis. And again, with this, we can do it with uh, CalViva or separately. And then sometimes we'll either meet with you again together or separately. And then from there, we get we do a warm handoff to our contracting department and they will follow up with the other information that they need maybe like a w9 there's a packet that you guys have to fill out and then from there they are taking over and that process can take about three to six months so therefore like i said maybe zero to six to nine months it could take any questions thanks brandy yeah uh, let, let's sure. turn it over to uh, to crystal from health net and then we can pause for questions both for you and for, for Crystal from HealthNet, thank you so much for reviewing that. And as a reminder, and with a shout out also to Alexis for putting the link to the letter of interest in the chat as well. We'll do the same thing where we can for HealthNet. Um, so Brandy, thank you. We'll come back to you with questions I'm sure that this group will have. Uh, Crystal, if you're if you're available, we'd love, love to turn it to you. And again, feel free to just tell us to advance the slides. We have a couple of slides as well outlining the, um, the elements of your certification process. And also, I think, um, Crystal, if you could uh, do a little intro, we did intros earlier, so if you could let folks know who you are, that'd be great. Sure. Crystal Harris, Manager of Operations for HealthNet, CalViva, CHW, CalAIM, you name it. All righty. Uh, what do we want to go through these slides for the HealthNet piece? Yeah, let's go to the next slide here, and then you can walk through maybe the um, provider's form and then the certification. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So this is a quick screenshot of our actual provider interest form. Um, it is fairly easy to fill out. Um, and we do need it as kind of the first step to understand that you're interested in the program, right? It's our official documentation of you demonstrating that you may want to enter the program. You may want to learn a little bit more about it. So important pieces here are highlighted in green counties, of course. We need to understand which counties do you want to go into. That's not only important for understanding your network and your demographic area, right? But also because you'll be assigned um, subject matter experts to the counties that you may be wishing to oversee. Um, and then of course, the big one, what type of service do you want to offer, right? Are you looking at meals, housing, recuperative care? I need to know that. And then a little bit of a resume, if you will, areas of expertise, right? Tell me what you've done before that may be either similar or identical to the care that you are possibly thinking about going into. Um, capacity is a big one here, um, not only for your managed care plans, but it's a big one for DHCS. Um, if we go through this process, so of course, it's just the interest form, right? Not to scare anybody, this is baby step one. Um, but if we go through and all the way and execute a contract, um, you will be asked for an official capacity. How many members can you serve on a regular cadence? 
And we are actually held liable to reporting that back to the state as well, right? We also have to demonstrate that we have a sustainable network and we can't do that without understanding how many members you can actually service. So just a hint on there. Um, you don't have to make it as, a, as serious as I'm making it sound on this form, um, but you will eventually be asked for it if we decide to go into contracting. Um, and then of course, additional information as it relates to capacity. So we can go to the next slide if everybody's done looking at this one. All right, and then comes the certification application. So you can fill out the PIF, right? Like I said, that's kind of our first wave of documentation demonstrating, hey, Crystal, I need you to come talk to me. I wanna hear about this program. I wanna know more about it. Um, you are handheld through this entire process, just as an FYI. You don't have to go find these forms. Um, even though we will supply them to you, you don't have to go find them. We'll give them to you every time you ask. And somebody holds you through the process of the certification application as well. Um, it does meet the HCS requirements and it goes a lot more granular than the PIF. It is many, many pages. Um, and it goes into, do we have licensing? Do we have TIN? Do we have MPI? Um, what kind of provider do you wish to be, right? Um, really defining what the services are that you're going to offer. And this is full on, not only a resume, but it is truth to the word. It is an application. This is where criteria will be reviewed to see if you're ready to step into that contracting process. We can go to the next slide. This is what it looks like. You know, what application is cute, right? It's not the cutest thing you've ever seen. It is very long. It is very detailed. Um, I will not promise you that you will have fun filling it out because you won't, but we do need it. Thanks, Crystal. So yeah, maybe we can, thank you so much for that, Crystal. And um, um, at least this part, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make sure it's fun. Uh, Crystal, to your point, by pausing and seeing if anybody has questions, um, especially because you guys have covered some really great information here. I'll also just forecast that um, after it, some questions you might have about the process, uh, you might have questions about just the content um, areas that both uh, Brandy and Crystal mentioned. And so some of the upcoming slides in a few moments are going to uh, walk through some of the requirements, um, service requirements and contracting requirements. Um, that might give you a bit more context, but uh, let's pause here and see if anybody has any questions for either Brandy or Crystal. And feel free to um, to use the raise hand thing and Zoom or just simply unmute and, and ask. Well, I think some questions might come about as we go further along the, in the uh, the content here, Southern. So I'll turn it back to you. And, and um, as a reminder for, oh, there we go. Carol has a question. If we're already contracted with DBH and Anthem to provide mental health services, do we fill out these forms as well? So Carol, thanks for asking that question. Um, I think the, the answer is yes. Um, but uh, Crystal and Brandy, do you want to confirm <laughs> If you're an already contracted provider, then no, you don't have to fill these out because we should have already have all this information for you. Are, that... you. are you saying contracted with Anthem? Is that right, Carol? Yes. Okay. So no, you've already went through the whole process. So you're good to go. Brandy, thanks for clarifying that. And actually, for my own knowledge, um, and to Carol, your, your great question there. Are there particular details in the certification applicant or the pro provider interest form that maybe would, would not be captured in the the existing um, information that Carol and her and her group sent? Do you still need a provider information form to capture some information about community support services? No, we should have all that already. If she's she's already done the provider interest form, she's already done the application, went through contracting, so they're ready to go. They're ready to provide services and and bill. Great, thank you for that. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, and I have a, a follow on for my own edification to Brandy, if I can say on this. So it's um, Carol, you're providing mental health services through community supports, or are you contracted in some other way to provide mental health services? Um, and if there's a distinction there, Brandy. Like, are, are, are there any CBOs that are contracted with Anthem outside of community supports? 
um, to provide mental health services, or is that the way that? So they usually contract with the uh, behavioral health department, and I'm yeah. guessing that's what DBH is, Department yeah. of Behavioral Health. Yeah, and then they contract with us as well, or CalBIPA. Yeah. Depending on the severity of the mental health issue. Right. So yeah. that information now kind of transfers over to the community support provider, the certification yes. process, which makes it easy. That's great. That's great. Um, I know something that I've heard, you know, both Anthem and HealthNet say before also in kind of in the same vein of this question is um, that, you know, if you are applying with one plan and you would like to have that um, process underway with the other plan, I know there is a, like a lot of reciprocity um, in that CBOs can, you know, ask the plan that they're working with to share it with the other plan so that CBOs don't have to fill out that application twice. Um, so kind of in that similar um, way that Carol's asking, you know, if we're already contracted, do we have to do this again? Um, if I, we're already contracted with Anthem, do we have to do it again with HealthNet? I know that there's a lot on the back end where um, Brandy Yu and, and Crystal's team are, are working together. Yeah, they just need to reach out. So if they're contracted with us and they want to contract with CalViva, then they just either can let us know or let CalViva know. And then either CalViva will reach out to us to ask for the information or, you know, we can just go ahead and provide it to them. And then one last question to, to both uh, Brandy, you and Crystal, based, based on what you've seen come through, especially as um, organizations are, are kind of thinking about the certification application. And yeah, Michelle just kind of plus one that, that is great news, right? About the back end kind of uh, coordination that the plans yeah. are having. So I don't want to skip over that. That's a big deal, <laughs> which I'm sure is appreciated by a lot of CBOs. Um, and I'm sure, you know, your respective um, you know, colleagues and staff as well. Um, one question, I guess, based on that experience, and obviously you've already made some modifications, like what you just talked about, Brandy, where your Anthem and Health and CalViva are sharing information. Are there other kind of challenges that you're seeing come up, or common kind of pitfalls or, or gaps in the applications that you're getting that you just want to um, address right now, so that people who are thinking about this maybe a little earlier can avoid them? Yes. Um, so a few things that we're seeing. Is, is when the CBOs or providers are providing documentation, we're, we're maybe not getting it um, directly geared towards whatever CS um, service that they're trying to provide. So say we need like a program overview um, for medically tailored meals. And so maybe they offer something, some type of meals, but again, it might be not specific to what DHCS is definition is of medically tailored meals. And so we're having to go, that's a lot of the back and forth where it's like, okay, we need it specific to this. So we do like to provide the CM and the CS um, DHCS policy guides so that they can use that as an outline for when they're filling out their applications. And basically what it is, is, you know, we'd like you to go through and pretty much answer the questions like, how are you going to provide this medically tailored meals? Well, let's see what, the qualifications that DHCS says. And if you can do that, put that in there, you know, and it just, it just makes it a little bit easier um, for everyone all around. And then I know sometimes um, with like staff training, so it could be like cultural and linguistics training. Do you provide that annually to your staff? And if so, give us maybe the training schedule or, you know, what you're training your staff on. So just different things like that. Just make it very specific and answer the questions like specifically. <laughs> yeah, just to elevate yeah. that point, Brandy, really appreciate both of those. And I'll turn it to Crystal in a minute as well to get your feedback, Crystal, on common kind of pitfalls. Um, one, it sounds like clearly uh, on, the, on, on each plan side, you have to, you're using the state policy guidance on ECM and community support to be able yeah. to, to align and, and because you have to do that. And so it sounds like the more that we can, for example, today in the, in the chat, and the more in general that um, CBOs can be aware of that policy guidance that you have to align with on the state in advance, the easier it is for them to align and for them to be able to help you align with the state. So using the ECM and the community support policy guidance as a reference document to kind of crosswalk um, as they're filling out the application seems like it's really helpful. And then the other, to your point about, I'm being very explicit about the, the culturally and linguistic appropriate services kind of trainings that they're providing for staff and the more details there, the better. Um, sorry, yes. Right. That's really helpful. Yes. Um, so yeah, we'll put some of those links in the chat to the policy guides as we find them. I know that we just shared that in another session yesterday. So thank you for that. Crystal, how about you? Any common pitfalls in addition to what Brandy was highlighting that you're seeing? 
Um, in addition to Brandy, I'm 100% aligned there. Um, and also, you know, work with whoever your subject matter expert is that's assigned to you through this hand-holding process, right? This isn't something that you have to fill out independently. Um, you can lean into whomever that point of contact is because to Brandy's point, let's get it right the first time. Um, those are lessons learned, right, for all of us. Um, we used to have to go back and forth probably 12 times with a certification application um, for clarity and defining, et cetera. And now we've really gotten it down to, you know, one time and we get it right the first time because we're really working with our partners to make sure they're putting in the right information. Um, the only other thing I'll probably add is just make sure that the application is always filled out only for the services that you are available to immediately render when a contract is executed, right? Let's say that you want to offer um, recuperative care, right? That, that's the service that you offer either right now or it's a service that you're familiar with. So it would be easy for you to step into a contract. And let's say, uh, to piggyback on Brandy, maybe you wanna do medically tailored meals, right? Maybe you are defining resources, you're gonna look into funding, et cetera, and it's a, a brainchild of yours, right? And you not put that on the application until you're actually ready to service and render medically tailored meals. Um, these applications are easy to go back and add certain things, like Brandy said to um, the Department of, of Behavioral Health, right? Um, mm -hmm. Once we have the PIF, once we have the application, if you want to add a service, it goes a lot easier, right? It doesn't take much time. Mm -hmm. um, contract amendments are not hard to execute, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. you know, if we put meals and we're maybe a few months away from that, it delays the overall process, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of teams look at the contract and they'll have to go back and forth talking about, well, they don't have this, they don't have that. So, um, I, that would be my my number one thing that we've seen a lot of is make sure for your first time filling out the application, handhold with your partner, number one, and then number two, only fill out the applications for the services that you can immediately render care for and mm -hmm. let us partner with you to build the additional services that you want to offer and add them to the application over time. Um, don't add them all at one time. And those are probably the only two things that I would add in addition to um, Brandy, we're, we're pretty aligned on what the, what the misses are and what the achievements are and, and what we can do better, right, from both sides of the house, so. Really wonderful, yeah, I, I think um, that, that, uh, that point about avoiding overcommitting, there are other kind of funders and other kind of arrangements where sometimes, uh, as we've seen time and again, nonprofit CBOs in particular are encouraged to essentially say, if, if we get funded, then we could do this and then we'll build it on the inside. Essentially what they're doing is kind of a, if you build it, they will come kind of model. Like if we just overcommit, get the funding, then we can kind of fill yeah. that in because we need to do that. There's, in this case, you're saying very clearly, don't overcommit, commit to only what you can do on day one. Um, and with the knowledge that there's partnership and relationships in place to be able to build on top of that. So no need to overcommit or overextend, just yeah, clear. like absolutely keep the person that you're partnering with um, in line with your Christmas list, right? Like I still want to hear about it. Just mm -hmm. don't put it on the application because it will ultimately delay um, not only the review of the application, but then um, if it gets as far as contracting, it will delay that process too. So share your Christmas list, but in terms of application, rendering care the minute pen goes to paper is what we want on there. And, and just to follow up to what, what Crystal is saying, these applications are 40, 50 pages. So, you know, you if you're putting all these different services you're gonna provide, you have to provide the documentation for every single one. So, you know, you don't wanna waste your time in the beginning as well, you know, because you're gonna to have to provide all that or it's gonna be in standstill and then it's gonna go back and forth and that just prolongs the provider, you know, with getting contracted. So I think, yeah, what, what Crystal said is definitely key. Really helpful. Really helpful. Well, thank you both. Um, unless there's any other questions, which I'm sure there'll be other questions kind of germinating, but let, let's, uh, let's uh, so kind of continue on. I'll turn it back to you. And I'm sure the next bit of content is also going to provoke additional questions that are layering on top of what Brandy and Crystal shared. So thank you both. Yeah, thank you all. And I think, um, you know, the things I just wanted to reinforce was that like partnership building piece and kind of give 
our endorsement based on, you know, we've been doing these um, TA sessions in other counties and we've been working with Brandy and, and Crystal and their teams in other counties. And they have personally, individually, as well as their teams have gotten shout outs from CBOs that are further along in the contracting um, process um, for the point that, you know, Crystal just mentioned, which is, you know, really rely on those experts in the, in the plans who are walking through this and hand holding you through the process. And um, so many CBOs, their best practice was ask those questions of them. Um, make sure you're going back to them. They are so responsive. That's what they're here for, um, to be able to walk you through that application. So when you hear 40 or 50 pages, you're not doing it alone. It's not like a job application in that way, right? Um, maybe it's more like a college application with a guidance counselor, um, something like that. So just really wanted to you know, endorse that based on what we've been hearing from other communities who have been working with these two teams. Um, so thanks for sharing all of that. Um, we had another quick poll here. Um, I know some of you answered this in your intros, um, but if you don't mind just launching this to, for us to better understand, you know, what are the community um, support services that your CBO has experienced providing and really, you know, that you're looking to provide and contract with the plans. And so um, I heard some of those housing transition navigation services earlier, um, as well as a few of others of these, if folks could um, just quickly take a look at this poll and offer your um, insights in terms of like, what are those community support services? And I will just say, you know, as um, Brandy was speaking about that gap on the culturally linguistically appropriate services, um, I kind of felt heartened based on the previous poll that we had um, in terms of how many CBOs in this room are um, serving people with limited English proficiencies. And there's probably a lot of that expertise um, in this room here. So I can close this poll out, share it. It looks like, um, you know, similar to what we're seeing in a lot of parts of California, which is there's a lot of housing support work um, being offered in this group. Um, some kind of a smattering of, of the rest, um, asthma remediation, uh, nursing facility transition, community transition, and um, food, medically tailored meals. Thank you all for sharing that. So with the remainder of the time, you know, we wanted to go at a high level on some of the contracting requirements um, that are that's being required by DHCS. So if we go to the next slide. You know, the, there's this role of community supports providers is um, through this engagement is to contract with plans or that you know intermediary entity if that exists and that's viable for you um, to deliver medically appropriate alternatives. Um, to state plan services. And, you know, a number of you are already delivering these services as you've, you know, indicated in that, that last poll as well as in some of your intros. Um, and so the, the main crux of this here though is that you're delivering this, these services in contract with the plans and that you're able to meet these requirements um, through DHCS kind of um, uh, requirements um, that are related to care models, billing, data sharing, and outcomes tracking. So, you know, we know that you're able to do the work, um, that you do it well, um, and it's really this like administrative piece that may be kind of the new new piece and figuring out how to make that work. Um, so if you go to the next slide, in the DHCS's standard terms and conditions, there's kind of like four buckets um, of core requirements that have to be met. So this is like when you're in contract, these are the criteria that you need to be able to meet um, to be able to you know, provide this work. And so today we'll be going through actually the first three of these. Um, so we'll be reviewing the service delivery criteria um, and then in a little while, also quality and oversight and data sharing. This will be at a very high level. Um, there is much more detailed information about these requirements that can be found online. And I believe that was what was just put in the chat. Yep, thank you. Um, so if you click on that link, you can see kind of the full um, guidance pertaining to the standard terms and conditions. And so we'll be kind of just doing this high level to get folks oriented to, to what is involved in that document. And then surrounding payment, you know, we are planning to um, discuss that in a future session, possibly session two. And again, you know, would love your feedback on whether that's helpful or if, um, you know, other topics are helpful. So to look at service delivery criteria first, this is kind of a three, three part section on service delivery criteria because there are um, within 
service delivery, um, different components. And we heard some of these terms in um, some of the application uh, materials and application content. So defining the service. Oh, one thing I'll say about this section is that we do include assignments. So when you see the deck, if you review the recording, you can go back to these assignments as kind of ways to do your deep dive, to help guide your deep dive um, on, through the text of the actual service um, of the standard terms and conditions. So here we see the first three on service definition, staffing, and data sharing. And so with service definitions, um, and some of you answered this in the poll, right? So that you're able to say that you are providing sub community support services that are in accordance with how DHCS is defining those. Um, so when you see housing navigation, you may think that's what you're um, delivering or that is what you're delivering, but is it the way that DHCS is defining it? Um, just going back to that and making sure that, you know, you are aligned with what DHCS is, is uh, defining is that way. And so our assignment here is like review those definitions in the appendix um, in this presentation, um, as well as that, that are in that more comprehensive guidance. Um, and if you think there need to be any changes, like if you are committed to contracting in this way, um, and if there's any difference between how you're defining the service and how DHCS is defining the service, you know, do you need to make any changes to your policies or procedures to make sure that you're aligning? Um, and to have that conversation with your team if needed. Similar with staffing. So um, the staffing needs to allow for a timely, high quality service delivery. This is all kind of um, discussed in more detail in the guidance. What does timely mean, um, quality mean? But think about what that means in terms of staffing. I know in pre other sessions that we've had, this has been a, a major piece of what the CBO has had to um, kind of think through internally about what does this mean for workflow what does it mean for staffing? How will we make this happen um, based on what, uh, what DHCS is asking in terms of timely, based on the time limits uh, for response, that kind of thing. Data sharing is um, related to making sure that we're sharing protected um, health information and that you are able to document authorization from each member that you're serving um, and that you're able to confirm that you have that authorization to the plan. And so this is a really important piece um, in terms of how you may be doing your work, um, making sure that you're able to document and back it up. And so these are federal protections, um, plans, what we understand is plans have trainings available about this. Uh, usually that happens after contracting that you're able to um, access the trainings and kind of required to access the trainings and make sure everyone is read up on it. Um, but doing that kind of initial inquiry into whether your current data systems are able to store, protect, share that PHI is an important kind of piece to consider um, at this point. So that can be some of the, the homework and conversation that you have. If you go to the next slide, we've got three more here on referrals, outreach practices, and responsiveness. Um, so, you know, how are you able to accept referrals from plans? How are you able to um, act on them um, and uh, talk through, you know, how are referrals made and how will they be accepted? And so we'll talk a little bit more about referral processes. We're planning to talk a little bit more about that in the next, um, next session. Um, but, you know, a kind of a thinking through what that referral process would look like with your team, this kind of ref uh, refers back to the staffing as well as the workflow piece that I mentioned earlier, um, but is an important consideration. Um, outreach practices. Um, so part of what is required is to conduct initial outreach within 24 hours of assignment. So this um, links back a little bit to timeliness, high quality um, that was previously mentioned. And so um, are you able to do that? And is that kind of standard already for you or do policies need to change? Does staffing need to change? Does workflow need to change to meet that? requirement. Be responsive, um, again, related to timeliness um, and high quality. So be responsive to calls from members, um, maintain a phone line that's staffed um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What would that look like for your CBO or in partnership with other CBOs? How would, um, or a staffed or recorded voicemail, sorry, important distinction, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, is that already what you offer? Um, and if not, you know, what, what needs to be reconfigured um, to meet that. 
and then part three, um, the final part of the service delivery criteria kind of pillar there is um, these these components. And um, I think as was mentioned, you know, some of these components have been gaps. So like cultural competency, um, culturally linguistic um, appropriate uh, services um, is part of the delivery service criteria. Um, coordination with other providers in the network, non-discrimination, um, what should happen if um, a member should be part of other programs and services, um, if the community support is discontinued, like how will we support that member um, getting to a place where their needs can be met? And um, finally, needs identification. So um, any additional like identifying any additional needs for that member um, and being able to uh, send that back to the plan for authorization um, is kind of that final piece of service delivery criteria. I know that was a ton of information, right? Um, and so part of why we have those assignments is to help folks kind of begin to um, chip away at that criteria and look at it critically and see what that means for your own staffing and workflow. And I'm gonna pause here before we go to the other two sections. Um, and I admit because of timing, we might not get to those other two sections, um, but it will still be included in the deck and we can you know, decide to show those in a, in a future session if needed. Um, because I actually wanna call on our friends at West Family, if you're um, still here, Yolanda, Giovanna, and Maria, um, since you've kind of gone through some of this, right? It sounds like you've been through the, um, certainly the certification process, you're in, you have contracts. Um, was there any anything early on related to the service delivery criteria um, that was challenging or interesting that you think you could share um, with the rest of the folks here? Anything on service delivery criteria that um, turned out to be a best practice for you um, as yeah. you were getting into contracting? So I think the, the point you made earlier about um, only selecting the services that you currently are providing and not like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this you know, at a later date. I think that that's real important. Um, I think this also gives you an opportunity. Okay, so if you are providing that support, maybe it can be enhanced or you know, just thinking about your capacities within your organization. So this is a great opportunity to be a part of this, but at the same time too, it is, you know, for, well, I'm just gonna say for us, overwhelming, right? I mean, the application process, the paperwork, you know, just making sure that everything is is uh, completed. But but again, I think, you know, what you said earlier about just making sure that whatever services that you select, that is something that you are already currently providing. And that, you know, should there be an opportunity in the future to add like an additional uh, service? I think that, you know, I mean, I was just sitting here like nodding my head when you were, <laughs> when they were uh, talking about that section. So, um, and I think for us, like we're, we're at this point, um, I think that your next uh, training would really benefit us. So the whole best practice, the referral process, the intake, the documentation, the submitting of the invoices is like, that's kind of where, you know, where we are needing some uh, support in terms of really in, in terms of best practices, you know? So we have a system, but is this system gonna work, right? So, um, you know, so that's kind of where we are. And I'm not quite sure if I answered your question, but you know, but this information is very helpful. Maria, Giovanni, they're, they're new. So this was, I'm sure, very helpful for them to kind of get this background information, you know. And so whenever I'm seeing anything Cal AIM, I'm sending to staff, go to this training, go to this training, listen to this, you know. So, uh, but it was, you know, it was very helpful getting this information. Thank you, Alana. And I have one more question. I think you did a great job. Thank you for that response. And I think, um, you know, as you were, I love your reflection on, you know, really being true to what service you're able to provide or, you know, what your capacity um, is and being like accurate about that is such a good point. And I also think it can be difficult for CBOs to know what that is because it's not just what you're providing, but what you're providing with these requirements on top of it, um, right? So it, it might be a different number from what you did last year. Um, because you also have to make sure you're responding in 24 hours. Um, and so in that case, that might be a different number 
from the way a CBO was operating last year, where it was 36 hours or it was 48 hours or, you know, something else. Um, so did you experience any of that, like kind of having to like figure out what your real number is for the purpose of this application based on what you were committing to and the requirements? You know, and just based on, you know, our current housing program that we have, and this is where Maria is working in that program. So, you know, I don't know, and just, you know, just trying to figure that out, like, just making sure that, you know, like you were just saying, 36, 48, you know, I mean, we try to get, you know, if a client calls, we try to respond, you know, immediately. And so just going off of our, our current work, you know, what we're doing now. And so we just kind of felt like, okay, yeah, you know, we can, you know, we can do it. And I don't know if Maria wants to, you know, add any more um, to that. I think like you um, you mentioned, Ms. Yolanda, about responding to referrals within, um, you know, 24 hours or less. Um, currently, we are working with the emergency rental assistance program. So when we receive a referral uh, from an agency or even like a, a, just a member of the community, we get back to them as soon as possible um you know within less than 24 hours so we make it a, a point a, a goal to return those calls uh follow up on those referrals um asap yeah so it sounds like that criteria wasn't a a new one for you all <laughs> so that that sounds great thank you so much for for sharing your your experiences with that um so i know just kind of looking at time i think that i um I can maybe just do a really fast review of these um, quality and oversight and data sharing, um, just to kind of flash it on screen just a little bit um, as we go forward. So people you know, know what these are as you kind of do your own deep dives into the standard um, terms and conditions, but there is um, you know, conditions around quality and oversight as well as data sharing. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that, you know, Plans have to make sure that the community supports provider has access to um, demographic and administrative information. And so one of the assignments we're positing here is that, you know, you could look at what systems your CBO has in place to receive this information. Um, what would that look like for you? Um, this could be in conversation with your um, plan partner to better understand what this requirement means um, and what you would need to have in place. So doing that inquiry would be helpful. And also, you know, what information you might need to effectively provide the service, what, you know, administrative information, clinical, social service information. So when you're receiving these referrals, what are the components that you need um, to be able to do your work? Um, and then billing information to support your ability to um, submit invoices to the plan. Um, so, you know, thinking through what that process looks like as well. If we go to the next slide on quality and oversight. Um, the plan will conduct oversight of its delivery of community supports. And so, you know, one to be, you know, to be aware of that. So you're acknowledging that um, and that, that this is a requirement from DHCS that this oversight function is being required of the plan and that, you know, compliance with all of the obligations. So all of these terms and conditions that are um, being outlined, there's going to be oversight and, you know, ensured compliance with all of these. Um, and it could look like audits, it could look like corrective actions. Um, I know that a lot of nonprofits are kind of used to um, operating that space of, you know, possibly having audits, um, but just really acknowledging that. And so, you know, looking into what reporting is required um, by each plan, and then based on the reporting requirements, you know, are you able to generate the required reports for this oversight um, need? And what, if not, you know, what needs to be put in place? And again, this, you know, can be in conversation with your plan um, partners, with the person that's handling you through this. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide and see if, you know, folks have any questions at this point on kind of the term, standard terms and conditions, you know, kind of anything we've discussed. Maybe um, this time I might uh, ask uh, 
Deanne, if you're able to unmute, I know that um, you had expressed that you had contracted uh, with ECM in a couple of places that community supports was new for you. Um, see if like you had any questions or, you know, there are, there's additional things that you're curious about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, so, you know, our, we're coming at it from a little bit of a different angle and, you know, some of the, the community supports that we are thinking about are things that we provide in other areas. So it'll be new for us in Fresno. Um, so we're really looking at what, how, how do we find out um, what the inventory of community supports already is? For the ones that we're, we wanna offer, is there even a need or have other community um, CBOs lined up to provide those? <clears throat> how do we find that out? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so if there, you're looking to find out if there's like gaps in the network for yes. from the plans perspective, um, I yeah. would say reach out to the plans um, directly. I know that their contact information was um, included earlier in the deck. Yeah. And, um, I think folks, uh, if you don't have that, we can also, I mean, it'll be in the deck as we send it out. And if um, anyone's able to put it in the chat, I would say reach out to them and ask that question. Um, you know, okay. what are the gaps that they're seeing um, uh, among like the, the services that you're positioned to to offer and so I, I don't know if um there's a different answer that either brandy or crystal would would offer here no i would say the same thing yeah go ahead and reach out to us separately because we're going to have different gaps you know between both health plans mm -hmm. okay thank you sure thank you so much dean and sorry, can I add on to that? Um, yes, if we do, Deanne, that'd be great because then we could hear on your side what you feel like the gaps are or the gaps that you're hearing because sometimes we don't hear those same things. So it would be nice to have a conversation to exchange that information. Sure, okay. Um, well, we haven't started you know, the process in Fresno yet. We're in the Sacramento Valley right now, but we're, okay. we're supposed to start with ECM in Fresno in January, so. Okay. Great. So I had a quick question. So in terms of the, the referral process, right? So let's say, you know, Calviva or Anthem, they had a client who was in need of, you know, housing support. Would they go to their list of vendors that is providing that support and make that referral uh, to that particular vendor? All of our referrals for Anthem come through us. And then we have a team that will um, refer them out to our contractor providers. Thank you. And it is part of the question, you know, which contractor provider do they refer it to within a community support? Is that, I don't know if I heard that piece of the question. Right, right, yeah. So. I, yeah, I just heard gaps in services. So if, you know, if Anthem, Calviva recognizes, okay, hey, here's our client and they need support in this, you know, one of those listed areas. And then they go to that vendor that's providing that service, right? So. I'm yeah. just trying to figure the flow. <laughs> yeah, so if a, if a member um, needs service, depending on whatever, you know, uh, community support that they're looking at, um, the referral can come from anywhere, anyone. It could be from the member themselves, it can be from a CBO, it can be from a provider. They can um, fax in our referral form, they can call it in, um, they can email, you know, us if we need to, if, if someone has a point of contact as us, like say if we're working with you, Yolanda, um, and then, or they can use the find help as well for CS uh, services. And then it comes to our internal department. We have a team that um, works with all those CS providers. And so depending on what service they need, they go through our contracted providers. And then that's how, depending on their capacity though. So some you know, providers might be at capacity so they can't take any new members, but that's how we uh, decipher who our members go to. If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. 
Thanks, Brandy. And I don't know if Crystal, you have a, a different process for Calviva that you want to voice over. I'm not sure if uh, Crystal is able to unmute right now. Um, but I thank you for the question, Yolanda. And I'm I've kind of jotted it down in terms of you know that um, getting some visibility into what that referral workflow looks like, um, how people enter the the kind of flow and how they end up at the CBO. Um, sounds like it'll be helpful. So for uh, a future session, maybe we can see if there's a way to visualize that or kind of um, bring some clarity to that or or if there it might be that there's existing material somewhere to share on that point. So thank you for that question. Um, so I'm going to move to just kind of the conclusion here and you know thank you all. So you know if um, I hope you're you know still thinking about whether becoming a community supports provider makes sense for you that you're able to integrate some of the information you heard today to kind of understand some of benefits and challenges. Um, and as you know, questions come up for you, please um, continue to reach out to us, reach out to the plans when there's specific um, questions on the implementation, if there are questions on what additional types of TA um, that you think would be helpful, you know, we're happy to incorporate those. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, if you're able to just do this quick poll, these were some of the um, topics that we uh, we're thinking up for the next session, and I'll leave that um, up for a few seconds while I go to the next slide. Um, so if any of these are of interest to you, just, you know, let us know by clicking on it. I think it's a single choice, so it's really like which is the one that you're most interested in. And we will be um, hosting our next session in Fresno in November. Um, and in the meantime, you know, please visit our website um, to be able to see um, session, other sessions that have happened include in statewide sessions and other resources. Um, and I think we can close out the poll. Um, and we will, it looks like billing and claims um, was the, has the most interest with a few others. So thank you for that feedback and we'll take that into consideration for the future sessions. Um, if you go to the next slide, just thank you to our team. Um, at Health Begins, if you go to the next slide, I'm so glad, uh, really tremendous effort. Um, this is led by Alexis Taylor on our team uh, with strong support and leadership from Melissa Meza and Shiva Diman. Of course, thank you, Rishi, for facilitation support for today. Um, our partners at Transform Health, um, Gretchen Schroeder and Lisa Chan Sawin helped um, create this content our partners at Aurora Health who lead our statewide sessions and also contribute to the content of our session and um, Beth Siegel who um, helps us with evaluation to make sure that you know we're hitting the mark here. So thank you all. Final plug for the website. Please reach out to us. So um, grateful for your active participation today, um, for all of the insights you shared, the questions you shared, and just really looking forward to seeing you all again. Hope you have a wonderful, cool, cool weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.